So for the message this morning, I'm going to ask if you would turn with me in your Bibles. We're going to be in, we're not going to spend a lot of time in this passage, but I want to open with it in 1 Corinthians 12, 14 through 20. Um, before we get to the point where we stand and read the Word and all of that, I want to give you a little backstory for uh, the message. Uh, most of the time, I like to preach in a way that's called expository preaching. You take the Scripture and you go through it. Um, Sunday night, it would have been a week ago, last Sunday night, I was laying in bed and I was not praying for a message for the church. I was not really uh, praying for anything that had to do with the church. I was just laying in my bed. You know how it is. Sometimes you can't fall asleep. And so you say, all right, I'm going to pray until I fall asleep. And uh, that was what was happening to me Sunday night. And um, as I was praying uh, to prepare for just different things, and especially after Sunday night, but specifically Sunday night, I, I'm not going to call it a vision. I'm not going to try to be super spiritual. I'll just say I saw a picture in my head of what looked like a, a distorted body that was missing some body parts. And it wasn't vulgar or vivid. It was very muted. Uh, but what I noticed, and, and if you see it on the, the title screen for the message, the message is titled Distorted. So the best representation I could come up with is, you know, if you really look close at that picture, there's some parts of the body that aren't there. And um, that really stuck with me. Uh, so I, before we jump into the fullness of the message, I would ask that you'd stand with me. Again, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 14 through 20. For anybody who's new here, uh, you don't have to stand the whole message. Just something that we do as we stand for the first passage in honor of the reading of the word of the Lord. Uh, but we're in 1 Corinthians 12. I'm going to start in verse 14. I'll read through verse 20. We'll pray and then we'll dig into this here. It says, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that wouldn't make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that wouldn't make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as He chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts Yet one body. I'll ask a couple of questions and we'll open with a word of prayer. Uh, how many of you would say, based on this main passage that we've just read this morning, that the body's made up of several parts? This is pretty simple. It's common knowledge. It's the same for the body of Christ. How many of you would also agree that it's important for the health of the whole body that each individual part performs its function? How many of you can agree with that? So physically that's true. Spiritually it's true all the same. Let's take a moment to pray and then we'll jump into the message. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises. My prayer today is that you would help me to say nothing more, nothing less than what you would have for us to receive. I pray that the seed of your word that is presented today would take root in our hearts and will produce godly fruit as we go about our lives when we leave in just a little while. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for your presence that's in this place right now. And we say every dividing wall has to come down. Every bit of demonic stronghold has to be destroyed and the freedom of the Lord Jesus Christ be released in this place among God's people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. If you aren't already, you may be seated. So as I was laying in bed Sunday night, I shared the story already, but the two things that I could not get out of my head as I was trying to go to sleep Sunday night were this image that I saw and the word distorted. And so if you've been in this church for a little while, you'll know that words mean a lot to me. I, I believe in if, if there's a word, let's see what the word means, right? There are a lot of Sundays that I'll give definitions from Scripture based on original language and all that. I'm not a Hebrew, nor am I a Greek expert, but I do my best to understand that stuff uh, and understand what words really mean. So I didn't have a passage that talked about being distorted, so I just did what anybody that knows English would do, and you're looking for a, de a definition. I went to Webster's Dictionary. And the word distorted in Webster's Dictionary means this. It means to be altered from a natural state, from a natural shape, or a natural condition. So to be distorted means that something is, is not in its natural state, it is not in its natural shape the way that it should be, or it's not in the, the condition that it's supposed to be. 
Now, as I go through this message this morning, I know that there are going to be various parts that might speak to you more than others. There are some people that if you're listening with the wrong heart, you might get offended with what I have to say today. But I'm here to tell you, I believe because I couldn't get it out of my heart and out of my head that this is a word from the Lord for this church house. I'm sure it'll minister to other people, maybe, if anybody from somewhere else hears it at some point in time. But I know this is a word for this house for this day. So are we ready to receive from the Word of the Lord? I don't care if you hear anything I have have to say let's hear what the scriptures and the word of God say I believe that there are people who would hear today's message that would fall into one of two categories the first category of body parts that were missing in this picture is it didn't have uh, any eyes or ears there were no eyes or ears and I believe that this is a really big problem in the church and because I'm preaching it here I will say it's maybe even a problem in this church so when you say, well, what does that mean, no eyes and no ears? I, I believe it represents people who are unwilling to see and unwilling to hear in certain ways. I believe there are people that would listen to this right now that, that you're unwilling to hear and see needed correction in your personal life. You're unwilling to receive correction whenever it's needed in the context of the family of God and in the church. I want to say this to you right now because we need to grab hold of this. There is no one who is above correction. Amen. Myself included. Yes. Now, now, this is not some motivated message by problems in the church. This is not me coming to smack people over the head instead of dealing with problems individually. I just believe it's a word from God for the family of God right now. Amen? Amen. This is not passive aggressive. If i got a problem with you, you'll know because we will have a gentle conversation about it. Okay? <laughs> So this is not me trying to take a veiled attempt to fix somebody's mess. I just believe it's a word to release today. But we need to remember that every person has to be willing to receive correction because we all need correction. We need to be teachable. I don't know everything and neither do you. Now, nobody likes to hear that. Nobody likes to hear that they're wrong. You've heard me say that if you've been in this church for a while. How many of you, when somebody comes to you and says, you know what, I don't think you're wrong about that, instantly joy fills your heart? <laughs> no! That never happens. Yeah. How many marital disputes would be thwarted if that was the case? Your spouse, your husband, or your wife looks at you and says, honey, I think you're wrong about that. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> what do you want for dinner, honey? Let's just move right on by that. That's not the way it works, right? Our fleshly response when someone brings correction to us is, hey, wait a minute. We buck up and we say, no, that's not the way this is. I'm not going to receive that. Excuse me? Now, friends, if we're not careful, the same thing can happen in the church. I'm not even just talking from uh, I, I, you know, elders, leaders in the church. I'm saying in general, we need to be able to receive correction. Now, let me be clear about something because I'm going to say this and then I'm going to move on very quickly. That doesn't mean that it's everybody's job to be the ombudsman of the church. Amen. And for some of you that have no idea what that means, it's simply it's not your job to sit and criticize everything that's happening and everyone that's within the church. Right? If you're looking for problems, you'll find it. The real issue is you should look for solutions to help your brother and sister versus finding ways to point a finger and tell them where they're wrong. How many of you agree? Yes. I got some people that are quiet, which means you're mad, and hopefully you'll repent when we open the altars here in a minute. <laughs> Listen to a couple of passages from Proverbs. Proverbs 12 and verse 1 says this Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. How many of you think that's a good idea? Listen to what it says at the end of that verse. Proverbs 12 and verse 1 it says, But he who hates reproof is stupid. I'm going to read this again because I want it to register. Whoever loves discipline. Loves knowledge. But he who hates reproof is stupid. Now don't ask your neighbor, but allow the Holy Spirit to examine you in this moment right now. If you were to compare your life to the verse that I just read, would you be considered a lover of knowledge or would you be considered someone who is stupid? Based on your willingness to receive God's discipline, God's correction. How many of you had... Uh, also buck up if somebody came to you and said, hey, stupid. <laughs> or what you're doing right now is stupid. Listen, the Bible says you're stupid. Let me, let, look, some of you that don't like technology, the Bible says that you're stupid if you are unwilling to receive instruction, discipline, and correction. That's, not, that's God telling you that through His Word. If we're unwilling to receive discipline and instruction and correction, it's stupid. 
It makes no sense for us to have that mentality. Proverbs 15.32 says this. It says, whoever ignores, instruction, whoever ignores instruction despises or hates himself. But he who listens to reproof gains intelligence. In other words, if you ignore instruction, it means that you really don't care about yourself. To be a person who says, I will not listen to discipline. I will not listen to correction. I will not listen to instruction. It means in reality, you don't really care about your spiritual condition very much. Now, for those of you that may not agree, let me give you another mental picture to look at. How many of you would agree this morning that a healthy child is always growing and always maturing in the natural realm? Right? You take a five-year-old child and you compare them to what they were like when they were born. Are they mature? No. But have they changed a lot in that period of five years? Yes. We're talking about we went from uh, you know, formula or breast milk to solid food. We're talking about being immobile to uh, moving to a place from, from crawling to uh, walking to running to playing, all these different things. Right? We're talking about not being able to say anything to the point they're five years old. You want to try to get them to be quiet. How I many of you are with me? You know what I'm talking about. In the context of five years, there's a lot of growth that happens in the life of a child. How many of you agree? Amen? The same should happen spiritually in the life of the believer. In your life, here's here's a problem that I see, not just in this church, yeah, in this church, but in the church, the body of Christ, is you have people who come in, they pray the prayer, and then they think that's it. Salvation is the starting line, it's not the finish. It's a beginning of a new life in Jesus. The Scripture doesn't say the old things have passed away, the new is here for a second until you go on to glory. It says, no, the new has come. The old things of your life are supposed to die. The new part of you, which is made new, transformed in Jesus, begins. And when you think about all these different things and how it ties into what we're talking about, being willing to receive correction, being willing to receive instruction, friends, if you show me a person who is unwilling to receive instruction and correction, I will show you someone who is immature. That's just the way it is. You may not like to hear it, but it's the way it is. How many people have come into the church have prayed that prayer, and they don't grow at all. They don't get involved in ministry. And I'm not even just talking about the needs of the church. Yes, that's important. And I'm not belittling those things. Yeah, there are people probably in this room right now, you're not doing anything in this church that you should. But I'm also saying in everyday life, whatever God ordains for you in a walk of obedience, you're not obedient because it... It might require something of you or God has to train you in some way and you're unwilling to learn and grow. You say, forget that. I know everything that I need to know. Excuse me, who do you think you are to know, think that you know more than God? I'm, I'm not getting a lot of amens, but that's okay. I kind of didn't expect to on that. And I really believe this connects to another part of a lot of what we're talking about. People who are unwilling to see and unwilling to hear spiritually. You know, we talk about, uh, we bring up in a lot of cases, I think Rodney even mentioned this passage when he was here a few weeks ago, in 2 Timothy 4 and verses 3 and 4. A lot of people talk about this when it comes to the world, but this is a lot of people in the church. I want you to, when we read this passage, these two verses, I want you to think about yourself. Not, oh yeah, this is how the world responds. There are people that are in church right now that this is their mentality. Second, that's why I'm not getting a lot of amens. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4 says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off in the midst. How is it possible for somebody who would come in and sit in a church week after week, service after service, Sunday after Sunday, to wander off in the midst? It's because they turn away from listening to the truth. There's an unwillingness to receive godly direction, especially when it makes us uncomfortable. But I want to challenge you with something. The word disciple means to be a student or a learner. How many of you know that? If you want to know what the word disciple means, that you're a student 
or a learner. So to summarize, I want to ask a question. If being a disciple of Jesus means that we are His students, then are we truly disciples if we're unwilling to learn? The answer to that question is no. You cannot call yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ if you are unteachable. Point blank, exclamation point. I was going to say period, but I need something with a little more emphasis. If you're unwilling to learn, and we all need to be willing to learn. I said that earlier. This is not me pointing a finger. This is me saying we all need to do this together. If we're unwilling to learn, are we really students? No. And I think there are a few more things that I saw on Sunday night in prayer. I get this image in my head. And they, can, they really do connect to some of the things we've talked about so far. Now, I believe there's people who are unwilling to see and hear things that they need to see and hear because it causes them to feel, I, I don't like that. Don't tell me I'm wrong. Don't tell me I need to do more. Don't tell me I... Friends, I, not only is, is the church missing eyes and ears, I believe the church is also dealing with an issue of no hands or feet. And I believe this describes people who are unwilling to step out of their comfortable patterns. People who are unwilling to say, I will go. We sang that this morning. Lord, I'll go. I'll be the one. People who are unwilling to be obedient to fulfill the great commission that God has set for us. And if you've been in this church for a while, you've heard me read this passage about a million times. But Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus tells the disciples, He says, all authority in heaven... All authority on earth has been given to me. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm the boss. I'm in charge. And we like to think of Jesus as meek and mild. And, and both of those things would describe Him. And I think I even said this last week, but Jesus, when this is all said and done, read the book of Revelation. He's coming with a sword. We've got this sissified Jesus in the American church where everybody thinks we can run to Jesus, get from Him what we want, but not have to bend the knee. Friends, that's not how this works. Every knee bows to Jesus. Every tongue confesses to Him. Everyone has to understand that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Him. He is in charge. And he goes on to say, because I'm in charge, verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And then the beautiful promise, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I mentioned this briefly last week. I'll say it again today. There's no such thing as an on fire and a passive Christian. You can't be both at the same time. Those two descriptions cannot be joined together. You are either on fire and active in the things of God, or you're not doing anything. And you know what I find is interesting? This is probably it should challenge some people. The depth of your love for God is proven in your activity in the things of God. If you really love Jesus, you'll do His work. And that, that, that's all. So if you're not doing anything, I would check your relationship with Jesus. He's just saying this so I'll do more in the church. No, I'm saying this so your heart will be set right in the things of God. Will that mean you'll do more in the church? Probably. But maybe not as much as what you're worried about right now. I don't have a list out there for people to sign up for needs of ministry within the church after today's service. It's a time to reflect and go to the Lord and pray and say, Lord, what, where am I at with you? Where's my relationship with you? Because I can promise you, you can see it in the lives in the early church. These are people who had radical encounters with Jesus and it dramatically transformed the rest of their lives. The early church in the book of Acts is not filled with people who simply had their little prayer in the altar and they went about their lives as if it wasn't that big of a deal. No, their lives were changed. When Jesus called some of the disciples, they left their boats and said, we're leaving our whole life behind to come and follow you. Saul, the one we know as Paul, is on the way to persecute Christians. He is blinded. He has a radical encounter with Jesus. And one of the biggest persecutors of the church becomes one of the biggest pushers and encouragers and apostles of the church. 
When you have an encounter with Jesus, it changes your life. So my question is, this morning, what kind of an encounter have you had with Jesus? And have you allowed Jesus to change your life? Are you that person that has no hands or no feet? Your hands aren't open to give. Your feet aren't willing to go. Ephesians 2.10. So everybody loves to talk about Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9. I'm saved by grace, through faith. It's not the result of works, lest I should boast. In other, more simple terms, I am not saved by what I can do. God's grace is offered to me, and I have faith. Right? That's Romans 10 also. We confess with our mouths, believe in our hearts that Jesus is Lord, and God raised Him from the dead, and then we'll be saved. So we're saved by grace, through faith. We don't earn salvation through what we do. But then the very next verse... Ephesians 2 and verse 10 says this. says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Help me. Good works. You were created for good works. You were created for good works. What's James say? Faith without works is what? Dead. So you show me somebody who comes into the church and their life does not reflect kingdom work. Now, kingdom work is going to look different for everybody. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to have a platform. It doesn't mean everybody's going to preach. It doesn't mean everybody's going to sing. The things that God might have gifted and called you to do are going to look different. Remember, we read in our main passage that there's a whole bunch of parts in one body. Not every part looks the same, and it's not supposed to. How weird would that be? If we had a bunch of people who were evangelistic within the church, then we have a lot of people that can lead others to Jesus, but there's nobody in the body of Christ that can train and teach and encourage, in other words, to disciple those who've come to saving faith in Christ, then friends, we're missing something. I bring that up to bring the bigger point that the body needs your gifts just as much as it needs mine. We've built this hierarchy type of system within the church where we say it's all about the pastor or it's all about the pastoral staff or it's all about a select few when the Scripture teaches us that everyone is called to go. So my question is, don't answer it out loud, contemplative, rhetorical, think for yourself here. Are your feet moving? Are your hands extended? Some of you might be able to easily say, yes, that's me. Others of you might be feeling conviction right now. Let me encourage you. Conviction is not just to show up. Holy Spirit conviction is not just to show up and tell you how bad you are. Holy Spirit conviction comes to show you what's wrong, to shine a light on it and say, this is what's off. Now come to me and let's get it right. No hands and no feet. Also discuss people who are unwilling to give and unwilling to serve others. There are a lot of selfish Christians in the American church. And based on the fact that this is in my notes, and I believe it's led of the Holy Spirit, there are probably selfish people here today. Did you just say that? I did. <laughs> For those of you who are new here today, we've been here almost eight years. So uh, I know this might be your first time, but um, this is just kind of how I do it. If you're offended, I'm not sorry that, about what I'm saying. I'm sorry that your feelings are hurt. But I'm just going to speak the truth. And I say it with a lot of love. I'm not trying to beat anybody down today. I'm saying that, that we all can grow in all these things probably. None of us are perfect in these, so we all need to receive from the Word of the Lord. What's Philippians 2, 3, and 4 say? Do nothing. Look at your neighbor say nothing. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, there's a revival that needs to happen in the church. Humility. Count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Are we willing to view other people in this way? Are we willing to be active in what God's called us to do? Are we willing to lay down our own wants for the benefit and for the sake of what someone else might need? Now what those needs look like are different. Sometimes they need somebody to pray with them. Sometimes they need food. Sometimes those needs are more practical than others, but the need is still there nonetheless. And my question is, are we willing to serve in that capacity for one another to say, I see that you have a need and I'm going to be the one to meet it. 
Do we care about other people enough, even when we come into a gathering like we have right now this morning? Are we willing to come together and say, you know what, at the end of the day, I know I have my needs, but what I'm worried about more than anything else is God using me to maybe help somebody else. You know what I think happens a lot of times in the church? I believe there are people who come in and maybe they'll get a little word from the Holy Spirit. They say, you see that person over there? They just need somebody to go and say hi to them. See that person over there? They've been struggling. You know that 20 that's in your wallet? Give it to them. That's one of the day. How many of you have ever noticed I don't really announce if I ever preach on giving? Because nobody comes. I mean, how many of you reckon? Don't talk about my wallet. Don't talk about my possessions. No, we're talking about your heart. We're talking about your heart. Are we willing? Because listen, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. I'm telling you right now, the things that you treasure show your heart. What are you unwilling to give of for somebody else? Look, I could spend a lot of time on this, but I want to summarize it by looking at Proverbs 11 and verse 25. Now, this is a promise. It says in that verse, Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. I, th- I think while we were gone, somebody preached a message on reciprocity and talked about, in other words, more simple and probably not as good as the message itself was, reaping and sowing. What we give will be given back to us. So here's what I find in the church, and this is what proves, the, the, for lack of better description, the level of maturity within the body of Christ. There are people who come into the church and they're mad because they don't receive, but they're also unwilling to give. How come nobody sees my needs? Have you taken any time to pray about maybe God using you to meet someone else's? Because my understanding of the biblical principle is this. When it comes to the family of God, if I live a life that's obedient to the Holy Spirit, and I just do what He guides and directs me to do, then what's going to happen is He will use me to impact other people, to encourage other people, to help and build up other people. And what's going to happen from that is God's going to use other people to do the same thing for me. But a lot of people come in to church like this. You got anything for me? No. Forget you then. <laughs> got something for me? No, I don't. No, I don't. Go ahead and get your wallet. I'll take what you got. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we come to the church, and, and, and especially in the charismatic church, Pentecostal church, everybody wants a word. If I were to announce, hey, we're going to have prophet so-and-so come here, and I believe in the prophetic, I do. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit. If I were to announce we're going to have a prophet show up, the place would be full. Why? Because everybody wants a word they want to receive. But what if I said, okay, here's the deal next Sunday. I'm not making this as an announcement. It's a rhetorical question. What if I said, here's what's going to happen next week. God's going to use you to give prophetic words to other people. There would be some people that would be scared to death and wouldn't even come. Some of it out of just, it's a, a fear, right. Some of it out of, well, that's not why I come to church. I come to receive. Well, yeah, that's fine. You can receive. But why do we limit God to think that all we can do in the body of Christ is just take stuff? I'm going to take from you. I'm going to take from you. You came in, I'm going to take from you. I don't care if I can help you at all, but I'm just going to take whatever you can give me. No thought even given to how we can help somebody else. I I don't want anyone to answer this question, but I want you to think about it because I believe this proves a point. How many people came in this morning asking the Holy Spirit, how can you use me to help somebody else today? Now, I'm not going to say no one did, but I would venture to guess that there probably weren't very many. That's quite a statement. Truth's the truth. The truth is the truth. So I look at, if I had to summarize this whole message, and this would have taken way less time. If I had to summarize it in one sentence, I'd say this. We have to be willing to learn, and we have to be willing to serve. We have to be willing to learn, 
And we have to be willing to serve. Because it's that willingness to learn and it's that willingness to serve that unlocks our ability to receive all that God has promised. Are you willing to do those things? And as I'm praying, I'm like, okay, Lord, this is way different than the way I normally preach. You know, so how am I supposed to wrap this up? You know, I know we've got people who are here that, that preach sometimes and maybe have a long history of it. I'm not quite sure, but, you know, okay, Lord, how am I supposed to tie this all together? And I believe the Lord took me back to Joshua chapter 18. And there's a question that Joshua asks the children of Israel in verse 3 that I think is, a, is even a prophetic declaration and question to this church house today. He says to the people of Israel in verse 3, How long will you put off going in to take possession of the land? which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you. How long? How long is it going to take for you to take hold of that which God has promised? The same is asked for us today. How long are we going to put off taking hold of what God's given to us? Individually, collectively. How long are we going to stay selfish until we realize that it's time to let go of what our agendas might be? It's time to understand that We've got to stop looking at things through our own lens and through only what's going on in our lives and see the bigger picture. Are you willing to lay down yourself for the sake and for the glory of the kingdom of God? Now, I'm going to say this from a corporate perspective. Today's the day that change happens. I can declare that. I can't declare it over your life because that's up to you. I can't make that change. I can't push anybody to... to, I can encourage you. I can preach. I can get in in your face and talk until my face is blue. But it's not going to do anything. That's up to you. Are you willing to surrender yourself to the plans and purposes of God? Because at the end of the day, we need each other, man. We need one another. In a more broad context, we need our brothers and sisters that are gathered in other buildings right now. There are so many people that don't know Jesus in Columbia City, we could fill every church up with the lost. And the same could be said for every community all across the world. So are we willing to put down what we want? Are we willing to take a different approach to realize that maybe we've been those people who've covered our eyes covered our ears, have not been willing to give, and have not been willing to go. I'm just going to ask right now. I'm going to ask right now, and I'm closing with this. If you're willing to say, I'm ready. I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to step into what God has for me. I'm going to ask that you stand to your feet as the worship team comes.